Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk today. Uh, talk is usernames, the missing piece of the OSINT jigsaw puzzle. So before we kick off, just a little bit about myself. I'm Simon Hall, uh, security side on Twitter. Um, I've been in the industry now for over 10 years, so while I'm on a rookie, a rookie talk, first time speaking, but I've got a, a wealth of industry background. So I came from a, a network and security background, moving through pen testing, red teaming, blue teaming as well, uh, and with a kind of background in OSINT as well, uh, where, you know, working on CBEST engagements and various other bits and pieces. I'm a principal security engineer at Digital Shadows, where I do research into various kind of tools and techniques, uh, CVEs, uh, exploits. I do a lot of blogging and podcasts there as well, as well as leading the red team for Digital Shadows internal as well. Uh, so why recycling isn't so good for your environment? Uh, so I guess we, we all see kind of common identifiers when it comes down to user accounts and user profiles. And there are many pro uh, identifiers for a particular account, but there are several that are commonly reused. We all know about password reuse and how bad it is for, a, for an environment, right? We can take a, a password as an attacker and we can get initial access with it or we can use it for lateral movement or anything else. Photos. We can take a photo from someone's profile and we can use that as a, a kind of pivot point to identify other profiles as well. And then we come on to usernames as well, where we can take a single username and have a one-to-many relationship. So we can take that username and identify kind of you know, 15 other accounts with the same username as well. So hopefully everyone here is familiar with password reuse and why it's bad. Um, so we can take a single password and information from a particular user account and we can gain access to many online accounts if someone's reused the same password. Or if we're on a pen test engagement or anything else and we gain access to a machine that's been cloned across an environment, we may be able to take again a single password and administrator account and gain access to hundreds if not thousands of machines. We've all been there on pen test engagements. Um, so we can perform password spray and we can perform pass, uh, pass the hash and, and whatever else. End result in shells. So one of the less uh, uh, kind of pieces of information that I've seen out there, and I've done a lot of work with this in the past, is, and I don't really see many people talking about it, is, is image reuse. So if you've got a professional networking profile out there and you've got a photo on there, the chances are you didn't create that photo for that particular profile. Um, you created it on your holiday, with your family or wherever, and you've used it on your profile. Now, we can actually take that image and we can reverse look it up using Google Image Search or we can use TinEye or whatever else we want to use. And we can go from a professional pers a persona where there's limited information uh, down to potentially a personal persona where you may be disclosing more information. Uh, so there's actually quite a nice pivot point there, and I've actually gained some really good information from doing this. So the username debate. So the main talk is around usernames. Uh, so whenever I discuss usernames and kind of their relevance in open source intelligence with people, uh, there's a lot of kind of comeback and people saying it's pointless. One of the things is, you know, usernames should be assumed to be public information. 100% agree with that, right? We've all got a Twitter. We've got some people have Instagram, whatever else, where, you know, we want those likes. We want those retweets. We want people to share our information. So the username should be public. The problem comes when we have a username that is bleeding into our personal lives. We use the same, uh, same handle as a Twitter on our Instagram, on a Facebook. We use that on our ISP profile. We use it on any of the provider profiles out there. And this gives a bigger attack surface for the attackers to actually start being able to identify information on a person. Uh, usernames are useless alone. Couldn't disagree with this more. Um, it's not a silver bullet. It never will be. You know, it's not like finding a set of credentials in breach data. But we can take a username if it's the only identifier we've got for an individual. We've run out of kind of information on their email addresses. We can't find anything on those. But we've managed to find a Twitter handle. We take that for that personal per, uh, for that person. We can throw it into our own personal breach data if we have it to identify email addresses, passwords, password hashes, physical addresses, whatever else. So we can do a lot of things with a particular username. We can even throw it into something like name check, and we can discover you know 15, 20 different accounts from a single username. So there are a lot of things we can actually do with that. Say nothing about me. And this is normally Mr. Sisp, who's obviously got everything locked down. Um, you know, their accounts are all randomly generated for every single service. But that's not the case. We're targeting VIPs. We're targeting, or well, the attackers are targeting an individual in an organization where they've been educated about password complexity. They've been educated about password reuse and everything else. 
But how many people are educated around usernames not containing your year of birth, your country code, your first name, surname, first initial surname? And, you know, there's not a lot of education around this. So a password can actually, sorry, a username can actually disclose a lot of information about a particular individual and often does. So I'm going to run through this one pretty quickly due to time. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of methods out there where we can gather usernames for an individual. Uh, last year, we saw the OpenSSH in, uh, user enumeration vulnerability. It's a brute force method, but you know it's still quite valuable for identifying where devs might log in onto a particular organization. Um, you know, every website out there these days still has some form of user, num user enumeration through password resets or for account creation, and you know, bug bounties are often excluded. Um, but we also see RDP with no NLA, so we can actually scrape usernames from those really easily. But to be fair, if you've got RDP open these days, you've got bigger problems. So one of the key examples I absolutely love when it comes to uh, gathering usernames and username disclosure, Plusnet. I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with Plusnet as a, an organization, you know, pretty good ISP. And actually one of the only, well, a handful of ISPs in the UK that will give you a static IP address as a domestic customer. Um, one of the things that's lesser known about this is that they actually associate, if you have a static IP address with Plusnet, they will associate your username for your account with your IP address. So if someone gains your IP address and you're using a static IP address with those, they can do a reverse lookup and look at the PTR records for, for that particular IP address, and they can actually gain your username really easily. So from that, that can be then pivoted from an IP address through to a particular person's Facebook profile or whatever else. So I did a, a quick piece of research on this and took 1 slash 17. I was able to find 13,000 unique usernames and company names, and I want to do more research into this. But from a manual kind of dig into some of these, I was able to find Facebook accounts, I was able to find Twitter accounts, um, and numerous other things by punching into like name check. Um, but in one particular example, I found, uh, I'd used name check, found a Git, uh, GitHub repo for the person, found their Facebook account, and the GitHub repo actually contained information about a service they were running on the same static IP address. Um, so, you know, it can be a valuable piece of information. And this is all going from a single username. So the life cycle of a username. So the problem with usernames is, right, we, we can generate them with whatever we want, but they will follow us throughout, throughout our lives. So a, part, a username can be nonsensical in a sense. We can generate it with whatever characters we want. But people are lazy. We're all lazy. We're all guilty of it. We'll create a username with a identifier of some kind in it, you know, whether it is a year of birth, whether it is our first name, surname, um, or just a nickname that we've gone through childhood. You know, we'll, we'll start off gaming, we'll create a gamer handle, we'll go from one game to another game, and then it becomes, you know, part of our email address, we'll add it as a local part during, like, a Gmail creation or whatever else. And, you know, after 10 years, you've now got a username that's actually inserted into your whole life and we can use that information to kind of profile a particular individual a lot more accurately. So we can take, if we just have a username, we can take that and throw it into forgotten passwords on various services. Um, Facebook on the left, uh, eBay on the right, I believe. And we can use just a username and try and get some more information. From these examples, we can actually try and guess some of the information about the, uh, about the email address. Facebook, for example, will just give you the first and last characters of the local part of the email address and just star out the rest. eBay will do the same but truncate that as well. But at least with Facebook, you actually have an accurate count of the characters as well. So you can use that as kind of a, an identifier to try and guess that email address. Um, in this example, it's two services. You found 15 services, you found 20 services, 30 services. You can then take that information and collate it and make a bigger picture for a particular individual. Some of these services are really noisy. Uh, Facebook, for instance, will just email the person. Uh, so this is not great uh, as, a, as an example, to be fair. But as I say, when you've got about 30 different services out there to go from, someone's created the user account across them all, then the, the kind of the, the picture becomes clear. So once we've actually ascertained the email address, we can go through the standard process of throwing it into breach data if we have access to that to find uh, passwords and other email addresses associated, full addresses, and anything else we want to, to gather. But we can also just take the, the username again if we have that breach data and do a, a, a initial search from it as well. So, you know, 
A username is useless alone. Um, that's an inaccurate statement. We can do a lot with a username. Uh, and, you know, attackers do, and we do when we do OSIN as well. So just to quite quick wrap up on this, um, what we should be doing, we should be educating users and ourselves that usernames, while they should be public for our likes and our tweets, our retweets, whatever, right? Um, we should not blur the lines between our kind of our service providers, like our ISPs and our kind of our Twitter handles and the GitHub accounts and everything else. We should be making sure and educating people that there is a difference between the username you use from one service and the username you use for another one and how these can be used to against you. You say with the password reset stuff, the accounts will give you phone numbers, partial phone numbers, partial email addresses. If you do this across 30 different accounts, you can actually overlap that information and gain almost full telephone numbers. I've done this in cases where I've actually been two characters short of a full mobile number just from using various services. So we need to be more careful and kind of um, be cautious about how we reuse credentials and reuse photos as well. And don't overlook seemingly unimportant pieces of information such as a username or something else because these breadcrumbs can lead to a full kind of jigsaw puzzle coming together when it comes to open source intelligence. And if you do have a static IP address with Plusnet, drop them a message and ask them to remove your username from their DNS records. Um, but that's it. Um, thank you. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Silence. Huh? Huh? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> Go and Google him. But no, the, the email address was made up. So. <laughs> okay, it doesn't seem we have any questions. So thank you very much. Cool, thank you.